Psalm 2, David writes, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Now that sounds just like our evening news, doesn't it? The kings of the earth are warring for resources and pride and pleasures and control. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That word anointed in the Hebrew is Messiah. In Greek is Christ. So Jesus Christ is a title. Jesus, God's anointed. And the rulers take their counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Let us cast off God's authority. But he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. And then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. And then the king speaks. He says, surely I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, God said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and you shall shatter them like earthenware. And then the psalmist brings this to a conclusion. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment, take Warning, O judges of the earth, worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, that he may not become angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. This passage invites our eyes up into the perspective of the highest authority, the kings of the earth. Now, none of us in this room are the kings of the earth, but think with me of all the kings and dictators and Caesars throughout all of history, the most powerful, those who have controlled armies and math, massive wealth and resources and have controlled the course of history. And God looks down and laughs because his authority is above it all. They try and throw off God's authority, but it is futile for he sits in heaven and he has set up his king, the king of kings and lord of lords, and his name is Jesus. And we are warned, kiss the son, lest he become angry with you. Swear allegiance to him or bear his wrath. But you ask, what is this king like? He who has all power and all authority to whom every knee will bow, describe him to me. Consider for a moment his humble birth. He is the only one to choose the circumstance of his birth to write his own narrative so that he might unveil his very nature to you. And he was born into a poor peasant family, the son of an uneducated carpenter. Shame surrounding his birth of his unwed mother. Displaced from the nowhere town of Galilee in Nazareth, Forced 
to travel a week-long journey to Bethlehem, the small, disregarded town of David. And here they were, lonely visitors, without money or clout, faceless number in the crowd, unwelcome amidst the scuffle, insignificant and forgotten. And Mary gives birth to the Savior of the world amongst animals in an obscure cave and wraps him in rags for clothes. His only visitors are not medical experts, not royalty, not even family, but a small group of lowly shepherds from a nearby field. Friend, what does these circumstances, this unfolding narration, what does it say that it was written from an eternity past? It screams that Jesus' humble birth means that he is accessible to all. The poor, the uneducated, the insignificant, and the forgotten. The King of kings and Lord of lords is accessible to you. Secondly, during his life in ministry, he was labeled a fraud because he was a friend of sinners. Luke chapter 7 records for us that one day Jesus was invited to have dinner at Simon the Pharisee's house. And while all the important people were reclining at the table, in walked a woman of shameful repute. Apparently, Jesus had met this woman in the marketplace some time before, and he was kind to her. And he led her to repent from her sins. He gave her hope when all anyone else would give her was shame. Hearing that he was at a nearby party, she she went and grabbed her most valuable possession, an alabaster veil of perfume, worth an entire year's worth of wages. She was out of place and unannounced, standing behind him at his feet, weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with her hair and anointing them with the perfume. Now seeing this, Simon, the host, right, he concludes that he is a fraud. If he were a real prophet, he would know what sort of woman this was that was touching him. She was a sinner. But Jesus shatters Simon's categories on two levels. One, he knows what sort of woman she is, and he does not shrink back. And two, He takes the opportunity to defend her and to rebuke him. Simon, he who is forgiven much, loves much. Now, why does he do this? Because he is a friend of sinners. He has declared that it is the doctor who are in need of healing. He has come for the sick. He is a savior sent to save sinners. Friend, he does not shrink back from your sins either. They are not greater than his love, his ability to forgive. And it is their removal is the reason he has come. Thirdly, let us consider the great suffering of the cross. His death was not happenstance. It was a divine symphony written from eternity past to triumph over the evils of sin. He was betrayed and denied by his very own, falsely accused and unjustly convicted. He was mocked, spit upon, and beaten with a purple robe and a crown of thorns. He was scourged by Roman guards, stealing chunks 
and shredding his back. The crowd showed him no mercy as they cried out for a criminal, Barabbas, a known murderer, to be released in his stead. He carried his own wood outside the city walls and up the hill called Golgotha. He was stripped naked and nailed to a cross. The soldiers cast lot for his clothes as he hung for six hours on the tree and then breathed his very last. There is no God like him who knows what it means to suffer, who sympathizes with our weaknesses. So friends, the high exalted king of Zion, God's king, the one he has installed, who reigns above every other king, above all principalities. He is the king who meets our every need. He is humble and accessible to you, completely approachable. He has come to save you from your sin, to meet you in your helplessness, in the fact that you are away from him, and he knows your weaknesses. He has entered into your suffering. This is who he is. I wonder if you know him as Savior. Not do you know about him, Do you know him? Because your sin separates you from him and from a holy God until you bow before him and freely acknowledge your sin, that you are helpless, that you are in need of a savior. If you would place your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, at that very moment, you would be forgiven. You would be covered by his blood. You would be set free. At that very moment, it would be credited that you have bowed and kissed the son, that you have made the king of kings your king. Have you kissed the Son. The Bible says that if you have, you are a child of God. Has there been that moment in your life, friend? Do you know that you know that you know Him, that you are His own? There is a card in the pew rack in front of you It says faith response. If you do not know him, I beg you, right now, take out that card and begin to fill it out and check a box that says, I want to talk to someone about how to place my faith in Jesus. You can do that right now by crying out, Heavenly Father, I confess to you, I am a sinner and I have fallen short of your glory. But I have heard good news That is, that you have sent your son, that you have installed your king who reigns above it all, and that you have sent him to die on the cross for my sin so that I might be forgiven. And I ask you right now, in Jesus' name, to forgive my sin. And I will make you my king. And I will follow you the rest of my life. I love you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.